Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Siobhan Carroll, and I'm with Enterprise Health, and I'm your host today. Thanks for joining us on the webinar, Scaling Third-Party and Enterprise Risk Management. Before we get started, I want to give you a quick uh, housekeeping tips. The webinar itself will take about 45 minutes, leaving 15 minutes at the end for Q&A. Throughout the webinar, we will keep all lines muted to prevent background sounds. If you need to get in touch with one of our panelists or me, please use the chat feature, which is accessible by clicking the chat button that shows up in the bottom middle of your screen if you move your mouse there. You can also send your technical difficulties to me there uh, as well. If you have questions that you'd like the presenters to address at the end of the webinar, please chat them to me whenever you think of them and our panelists will answer them. After today's session, you'll receive an email from us. If you're interested in a copy of the slides, please let us know. With that, I'd like to introduce the moderator for our panel discussion today, Vikas Kosla, Enterprise Health's Chief Digital Health Officer. Vikas, take it away. Thank you, Shimon. Very much appreciated. Uh, welcome, everyone. We're very excited to present this topic to you today. Uh, joining us today are three featured uh, presenters. Our keynote presenter is Miroslav Belot. Uh, Miroslav serves as a CISO at Valley Health and has been a proven leader in healthcare technology for over 20 years. Leading high performing teams and large scale infrastructure and security programs, he holds a BS in computer information systems and a master's in information systems with a concentration on healthcare. Miroslav was recently recognized as one of healthcare's top 61 CISOs by Becker's Healthcare. Miroslav resides in New Jersey and is a huge fan of the New Jersey Devils. He is also an avid world traveler. Welcome, Miroslav. Thank you. Also joining us today is Brian Parks. Uh, Brian serves as Enterprise Health SVP of Information Security Services and leads our team of cybersecurity consultants and serves as the primary SME to our product development team. He has 30 plus years of experience leading technology and innovation teams with a focus on healthcare and life sciences. Brian lives in Pennsylvania, uh, so he can be close to the greatest football team in the world, the Pittsburgh Steelers. <laughs> Welcome, Brian. Thanks, Vikas. Tim Dennis uh, is our other speaker, and Tim is uh, Enterprise Health's Chief Product Officer. He leads our product development team. Tim is, a, Tim is a veteran of the United States Air Force, working in healthcare technology for almost 30 years. Tim is an innovative product designer and team leader, bringing several world-class software part, uh, products to the market, some of which continue to be widely used within the industry. Today, he's, uh, he's being widely used today, sorry. He has been recognized for designing and managing products that have the ability to automate complex healthcare processes and deliver high-end customer and uh, end user satisfaction. And I hear Tim is a pretty good golfer. He also lives in the Philadelphia region, which means he has a long drive to see his beloved University of Pittsburgh Panthers. And uh, I luckily am a fan of both those uh, teams. So that's why uh, uh, Brian Tim and I get along so well. So welcome speakers. Thanks for coming. Welcome everybody. So um, real quick note on Enterprise Health. Uh, we are an award-winning e-health cybersecurity solutions firm and one of the first certified high trust assessors. We provide health and financial security services and products that help our customers design, assess, remediate, and monitor their risk management programs, regulatory compliance, organizational resilience, and third-party vendor security. So on to today's agenda. Uh, we're really excited about the topic that we're going to be focusing on today. We'll point to factors in today's challenging environment that are really driving the industry to focus on evolving towards a better way to manage third-party and enterprise risk. Miroslav will provide some background on Valley Health and really set the context for why, for why this is such an important topic. Brian Parks will cover some important topics for us as well, including the keys to scalability, program optimization, and fostering adoption. Tim Dennis will give us detailed overview of the current market solutions and how they're evolving to meet the need for automation, scale, and optimization. And throughout, we'll hear from our keynote speaker, Miroslav, about his thoughts and deep perspectives on these topics. So let's start by taking a, a quick look at the trends that are driving an intense focus on third-party health uh, in our industry. As you can see by some of the statistics on the screen, the cost of cybercrime to the industry is now becoming tangible, uh, delivering a huge hit 
uh, to the industry in tw uh, 2019, uh, close to $2 trillion. Whether you're a hospital, payer, and insurer, a company that does business with many partners, the need to take action is pretty compelling already. For insurers, for example, the NAIC has expanded own risk and solvency assessment, or ORSA, goes beyond SEC dis disclosure requirements requiring firms to analyze all reasonable and foreseeable relevant material risks that could have an impact on the insurer's ability to meet its policyholder obligations. The minimum threshold for an ORSA program requires yearly analysis of all material risks. I would say this is a pretty lofty threshold, especially when it comes to third-party risk. Then there's the issue of cybersecurity talent shortage to defend our organizations at the level and scale required, almost 3.5 million job openings uh, as of this year. Maybe most important of all is your organization may have already been affected by a breach like 60% of your peers have. And there's very little comfort that it won't continue to happen again and again. If you think about it, you're just not managing your own security program, but you need to attenuate risk from dozens, maybe hundreds of your vendor security shortcomings. This is no easy feat. But as we're seeing, there is a way to start to tackle this massive issue. Security leaders are implementing solutions to comprehensively and at scale address the business impact and rising cause of threats and risks to their organizations with third parties very much at the top of the list. This is why Enterprise Health is so acutely focused on this area of enterprise risk management. Now, with that being said, let's get the presentation started by setting some context for the issues, identifying steps you can take now, and look at potential solutions for the future. And our keynote speaker today, Miroslav Belot, will also end the presentation with some words of counsel, uh, and some much needed inspiration uh, to for our security community. Miroslav, uh, I welcome you now to talk a little bit about Valley Health, uh, the current state of your program, and uh, how you're scaling that program up. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Vigas, for the introduction. Um, give you a little bit of background on Valley Health. Um, we are comprised of three main entities, the Valley Hospital, Valley Home Care and Valley Medical Group, which is comprised of about 100 owned practices, anywhere from a couple of providers to, uh, to a large number of, you know, 20 or 30 providers in the practice. So they're all owned and a lot of affiliations. Um, the hospital itself is a 40, 450 bed fully accredited acute care not for profit facility serving the population of Bergen County and, and adjoining communities, uh, comprising about 440,000 um, people uh, living in those areas. It, we also have uh, several large affiliations with healthcare leaders like Mountain Sinai Health System for Comprehensive Cancer Care, as well as Valley is the only hospital in New York metropolitan area to have been selected by Cleveland Clinic the number one uh, heart care program as a health care affiliate. A um, couple of notable recognitions from Valley in the past few years. Um, Valley Hospital has been recognized as one of the America's 250 best hospitals by health grades, placing it amongst the top 5% of hospitals nationwide for superior clinical performance. It has achieved a patient safety grade from LeapFrog in 2020. It's been ranked among world's best hospitals by Newsweek in 2020 and has continuously achieved a uh, magnet designation for nursing excellence, uh, always back since uh, 2003. A little bit about, about our current risk program. At Valley, uh, we view third party and vendor risk management as a critical component of our overall risk management program. Like many other community hospitals, we depend on and manage a large number of services that are provided or supported by outside companies or vendors. As we grow and improve our care capabilities, we often contract with both provider and vendors for specific services or for their niche expertise. Patient safety, privacy, and information security being the paramount of importance, we need to pull all of our vendors we, I'm sorry, we need to put all of our vendors and business associates, associates through a vetting process to ensure our corporate data and data of our patients is being used properly and that it is protected and secured. Miroslav, we know that the, the, the program is really important uh, to you and to Valley. 
What was the impetus for Valid's focus on optimizing its uh, TPRN process? So we have a couple of drivers um, for this need. From technology perspective, first, proliferation of cloud services, mobile applications, distributed systems, fully or partially managed or outsourced services, we need to make sure that partners we choose follow the same rigor and practices that we do internally to deliver quality services, protect our data, and adhere to all necessary regulatory aspects of patient privacy, information security, and data and system management. As the number of services and systems grow, it's becoming increasingly difficult to effectively manage and continuously monitor our overall risk with current resources. Today, the overall risk management responsibility is co-managed by our legal affairs team, corporate compliance, which includes privacy, and IS security team. At this point, we will continue this model of shared responsibility for risk management, but also look to broaden active engagement in the process to our finance, purchasing, and even clinical operations leadership. Each core group would focus on specific elements of the overall program that they have the expertise in. In the case of purchasing and clinical operations, improving vendor selection process to follow a consistent and gap-proof workflow that would better identify and vet any new vendor from service onboarding to its termination. Without automation, the challenge of juggling all the different processes, priorities, risk assessments, documentation is significant. Streamlining and automating these processes and workflows will enable us to effectively manage risk and not, on, uh, and not negatively impact the delay projects that enable Valley to meet its operational goals and objectives. In addition, as technology and operational practices are constantly changing, underlying infrastructure of systems and other capabilities of our third party vendors change as well. If an upgrade to a hosted system is being proposed and that it is significant enough, it might warrant an earlier reassessment of the vendor of that system. We need to be ready to effectively and timely reassess these changes and resulting risk to maintain our level of overall compliance and our commitment to quality. Thank you, Miroslav. We appreciate the opening and, and the context for this, uh, for this topic. Uh, next, we're gonna talk a little bit about scalability. And for that, um, I'm gonna invite uh, Brian Parks to really start this topic and discuss the keys to scalability. Thanks, Vikas. So as Vikas mentioned, we're going to spend the next couple minutes here talking about scalability, why it's important, and some ways in which you might address that scalability need. Information overload is what happens when your ability to process is unable to maintain pace with the growing influx of information. Business expansion, influx of new data, increased complexity, they all can lead to information overload if you're not growing and maturing along with your business. If you don't have good process, you won't be able to grow and mature to meet the increasing business demands. This can lead to process failure. Good, repeatable process is a key ingredient to being able to scale. Process failure can show up in many forms. A couple of examples that have come to mind. Um, as you become very busy, you get overloaded, you can overlook key risk factors and rush to get to the next task, and that can leave your organization susceptible to a critical breach. Maybe you take some process shortcuts or skip important steps just to get the job done and get move and keep moving. And that can also expose your organization to risk. And it's also a potential compliance issue. So you can easily expose the enterprise to increased risk of a breach of sensitive information if you're not able to grow, mature, and keep up with the business needs. Now, as Bacas mentioned a few minutes ago, the significant increase in cyber crimes, much of it coming as a result of lax practices by the third party, party partners, has put emphasis on addressing this risk. Third parties expand your data footprint and while allowing your business to scale, also adds another layer of complexity to doing business. And for many large organizations, as you heard uh, Miroslav mention, third parties and all of that process that goes around it actually have resulted in the need for a whole new business support function. Next slide, please. And speaking of third parties, 
Outsourcing is already pre prevalent in today's world, and it's only getting more so. Business operations are continuing to push their business forward. In order for the business to scale, they're increasingly using outsourced products and services. The result is an exploding inventory of vendor engagements. In order to keep up with your business, you're going to need to scale your risk management capabilities to, to meet that need. Scaling could mean adding staff, but really that's not ideal. Uh, it's not sustainable, first of all, and secondly, it's likely going to be met with significant resistance in the organization. So how do you scale your program to meet the need? Like at Valley Health, the emphasis is on making the most of the current staff and using process and tools to help. You have to take an objective look at your program and engage the entire organization to adapt and to scale. Take steps to improve organizational governance and process. We'll talk a little more about governance in a few minutes, but right now I want to focus on process. Process is key. The entire organization needs to be on the same page with how you engage with third parties and what those steps are to process and to go through that assessment. More new vendors means more vendor assessments, and you need to maintain the vendors you already have. Existing vendors need to be reassessed periodically or when their offerings undergo change. Assessments need to be thorough and thoughtful for both existing and new vendors and should be customized to the vendor's offering. A growing vendor inventory means you'll likely have multiple concurrent assessments at any given time, so record keeping is critical to ensure that you're identifying and tracking risks for your enterprise effectively. Your program needs to be able to support the expanding use of third parties while effectively managing the overall risk to the organization's sensitive information. So with that, uh, Miroslav, we would love for you to provide sort of a reference example of the keys uh, as we talk about the scalability and some, some examples that you can talk about from your career. Sure. Um, as we talked about earlier, the use of third-party service providers and use of outsourced cloud or remote hosted systems is growing. We need to enhance and expand our risk management capabilities to keep up with this phenomenon. But addressing the growth of services and vendors alone is not sufficient. I, I truly believe that our program needs to mature to a point where we can effectively support rapid changes in how Valid innovates and delivers care, especially after our recent COVID experience. Um, and to do so without losing our focus on awareness and visibility of risk, I will give you an example that I think some of you may relate to. As COVID pandemic hit all of us, Valley found itself being in the midst of one of the most impacted areas in New Jersey and in the country. In order for us to continue delivering best possible care and support our community's needs, we had to very quickly introduce services and supporting systems that enabled our clinicians to safely deliver care remotely. IT was tasked with rapidly providing our patients and residents of communities we serve access and capabilities that would enable them to be virtually seen, virtually seen by or simply communicate with their primary care physicians, whether to obtain appropriate medical treatment, diagnosis, get prescriptions or refills, or obtain admitting orders and instructions for COVID or other non or, or other urgent health issues. As others, we quickly mobilized and implemented telehealth and teleconferencing capabilities at all of our physician practices. A significant number. You know, I talked about it, over 100 practices. Um, this required equipment, software, licensing, integration to our core EHR systems, and lots of end user education. Decisions on best tool sets needed to make needed to be made quickly. Um, I would be very very insincere if I told you that all of these changes and new systems went through our current risk assessment vetting process. They did not. These new technologies were not fully vetted by Valley from compliance, legal, technology platforms, and security perspectives, but primarily on uh, system flexibility that were chosen. Use of these were, were, was really based on how quickly we can roll these tools out. We had to deploy these technologies and capabilities not only for our internal users, but also for our patients and families who had an urgent need to interact with our clinicians or with their loved ones. Our teams had to quickly enable and facilitate most difficult end of life teleconferences between dying patients who were in the hospital and their family members who were quarantined at home 
and were not allowed to come to the hospital to be with their loved ones at the most critical, most private, and most difficult times. Yes, CMS and other governing bodies temporarily suspended some of, some of the regulatory needs around security, but we needed to continue and track what technologies are being implemented without proper risk assessment and vetting so that once the crisis is behind us, we can go back and clean up. Whether it means removing non-compliant systems, doing a comprehensive risk assessment, or improving our internal controls and processes to minimize or eliminate any unacceptable risk that may have been introduced with these rapid technology deployments. In other instances, the organization turned to IT security team to do things that we have never done before, to quickly research and vet dozens of companies who flooded our operational areas with emails, offerings, uh, PPE equipment, breakthrough technologies, newly developed tests, medicine, services, and even financial assistance. We are poorly equipped to perform such vetting, not only from the resource bandwidth perspective, but also from easily available and accessible vendor profile information from trusted resources. Having the ability to assess this vendor information and access it to make the time critical decisions in the, is a major impetus for our risk management efforts. Thank you, Miroslav. Brian, I know uh, we're gonna switch to talking a little bit about how some folks are doing it now and some of the challenges and why that scale issue is so important. Yeah, so, you know, Valley Health's effective response to the COVID pandemic is one example uh, of how third-party risk management requires more than just a patchwork of manual processes and spreadsheets. Uh, and I say effective response because I think that um, Valley Health did a phenomenal job meeting the need that they had to meet. Um, they they made adjustments to their process, their vetting process, as they had to, uh, but they did not lose sight of the enterprise risk that they were incurring. Uh, and that's all part of risk management. Uh, and they were able to uh, manage that process and now are going back and they're able to complete all of the vetting and get everything in order, uh, which is all indicative of a really good solid set of leadership and governance and process. Uh, so that's a good example of when there is a rapid increase in vendor activity for any reason, you have to rely on your people and your process and your tools to respond. Without the right process and tools, trying to keep up, keep up with all those emails, phone calls, spreadsheets, whatever other means you use to assess risks from third parties, information will get lost, things slow down or get missed, and frustration really sets in. Business partners wonder why, aren't, why they aren't getting their services that they wanted, that they need, uh, and what, what, what the source of the delay is. You know, the vendor wants to know when they can move forward with their offering. We've seen this frustration come to the surface firsthand with some of our larger organizations that might have 20, 30, or even more assessments in process at any one time. Utilizing a leading edge platform could be the answer to support the, and facilitate the solid process, tracking information, and allow the scalability needed to support the TPRM function. Such a platform simplifies communication across the enterprise and with the third parties. It keeps information organized, it allows collaboration, it allows you to more easily manage multiple concurrent assessments, it improves your efficiency and effectiveness, and it measures and tracks the risks to ensure that your business is protecting its critical and sensitive data. A good platform along with solid business process checks all the boxes when we talk about scalability and managing enterprise risk. Uh, and now I wanna turn it over to Tim, who's gonna dive a little deeper into the technology solutions and how they can further help improve productivity and risk management. Thank you, Brian. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm gonna cover three topics today pretty briefly. Uh, first off, as, as Brian mentioned, you know, there are tools, software um, is, a, is a great tool to apply to help scale this third-party risk management problem. Uh, I'm going to spend a few minutes briefly covering some of the current solutions in the market. And then uh, lastly, kind of touch a little bit on the, uh, the platform of the future. If you're looking for how to grow your risk management program overall, what are the sorts of things you should be looking for? Uh, next slide, please. So before I get started, <clears throat> I'd like to share this quote from Bill Gates, because I think it really is relevant 
uh, to the conversation today. Um, what Bill has said is that the first rule of any technology used in a business is that automation applied to an efficient operation will magnify the efficiency. So that makes sense. I think we all would agree with that. But the second rule is equally important, and that is that automation applied to an inefficient operation will magnify the inefficiency. And I will tell you, I've experienced firsthand uh, throughout my many years in the government in early days, even uh, doing software um, solutions, that I've experienced both the first and second rule, um, you know, second rule uh, quite, quite uh, obviously. You know, one, one of my projects early on as a, as a quick little story uh, was for a large health system out on the West Coast who asked us to build them some custom software to help them manage their, their billing operation. You know, they were losing EOBs, not being able to be responsive to patient calls, et cetera. They spent a long time documenting their workflows, called us in to uh, kind of build a platform around, a solution around what they, you know, what they had been doing manually so that they can have greater transparency and, and uh, control over, over that EOB processing, you know, explanation of benefit uh, bill uh, processing. So we built all that, and you know, sure enough, they they gained some insight. <clears throat> excuse me, where their, uh, you know, where those EOBs were in their process. But guess what? They, you know, they quickly realized that, you know, they didn't re-engineer, reimagine, you know, their their workflow. They didn't understand that by building a a, a technology solution around that problem, um, the the choke points, the critical path items, were really um, uh, exacerbated because. Everything else was going faster, but the choke points were even getting worse and slower. So while they gained some insight, it really just highlighted where their existing process was weak. So, you know, they hired us to go back and then help them re-engineer that. So with that kind of uh, knowledge, I, I wanted to share with you, you know, that with software automation, you can't just assume that a technology uh, solution is going to be the uh, solution for all of what that ails you in third-party risk management. You know, my first, you know, my, my first goal for everything certainly is, you know, when we were looking at a process, you know, we want to know how to leverage technology. So my, my first tenant here is auto-generate everything, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. So software is really good at, you know, at um, capturing information. So you want to look for, um, you know, ways to auto-generate, say, your third-party inventory, auto-adding not just the third party themselves, the application, the services that they're offering, even your de internal departments should be added on the fly, your internal users, you know, that are stakeholders and all this, but also think out towards the third parties and their third parties, fourth parties, fifth parties, all of that should be automated in the system so that you're not spending time doing administrative tasks. Let the software do that for you. <clears throat> Speaking of, you know, getting to the assessment phase of the third parties, the, the software should also auto generate your assessments. It should, it shouldn't be though just kind of spitting out a standard, you know, control set of uh, NIST 853 that you share across the board with everybody. It should be tailored specifically to, to what and how and where that third party is doing things for you so that they're only being asked questions that are, are likely relevant to their implementation at your site, right? I can also tell you, you know, from firsthand experience, that, you know, we've received these assessments from, from other clients of ours doing, you know, that we do some other work for, and they're just generic. It's a one size fits all, and you spend 80% of your time just answering NA, 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 and explaining why that doesn't apply. So you want to use technology intelligently. And then obviously from the risk management perspective, you want to have predefined criteria that tiers your vendors, that auto scores, you know, your the risks based on, you know, the inherent risk level of, of that, uh, of that vendor, what they're doing for you, and then perhaps even auto-generating reports, or at least you know, a good portion of those, so that you're not spending time doing administrative tasks. Obviously, also when it's all online, you know, you get the real-time tracking aspect. But when you look at it, you know, look for solutions that allow you to parallel process. Uh, Brian was just kind of sharing, you know, the, the before and after uh, TPRN program view uh, of a manual process, you know, which is serial in nature, and you're kind of stuck waiting for that vendor to re respond with their uh, assessment answers. Well, you know, why would you do that? If 90% if of, the, of the security domains have been answered by the, by the third party and you have insight into knowing how far along what they've completed, why would you not you know, work in parallel, review those sections that are completed, access their uh, artifacts, their documentation to prove that stuff so that when you get the final submission and you've done 80% of the work, 
and you can be responsive to your internal business owners, right? Obviously, notifications, alerts also are kind of typical for workflow systems, but they want, you want them to be smart. You want them to be tuned to the problem, not inundate people, but nudge them at the right time, right place, right? In the end, what we're talking about here is that you should be leveraging technology. Yes, assume it will help you with the process, but really you should be looking at, at it to help you manage risk so that all your free time that you're freeing up uh, frees you from not necessarily just going out and hiring more security experts, but allows you to spend time digging into these responses because the third parties themselves have been able to spend more time on them because you're only asking them what's relevant you can dig into them, root out where the risks are with themselves or even their fourth and fifth parties. Um, you should be able to collect the risks in a normalized fashion so that you can compare the findings across all of your third parties and down the road, maybe even across your entire security program, you know, using analytics and intelligent dashboards so you can figure out where to apply your scarce resources to address your highest risks, whether it's third parties, you know, by, by a class or across your entire security program. And then lastly, when you have everything under control, kind of the promise of a, of a software solution, then you can start implementing best practices like continuous monitoring and even reassessments, not just when there's a new contract uh, renewal activity or a new contract in general, but maybe when there's a substantial security change, like a new module being implemented, a new upgrade on a new uh, infrastructure platform that you're aware of for that third party. Next slide. I'm not gonna spend much time on this slide, but I know many of you on this call are kind of looking or interested in what's, what's available in the market. You know, what this slide represents is kind of my view of, of, the, of the third party risk management um, solution set out there. And, and Brian already covered, you know, emails and spreadsheets, the manual kind of serial flow. But as you go across this continuum left to right, we start, you know, allowing folks to, to scale what they're doing today um, and then introducing technology, you know, along the right-hand side and more complex, but more potentially more capable uh, means here. So as we go from emails and spreadsheets to online self-assessments and assessor services, really what that does is allow you to kind of bring more, you know, more bodies to the fight or uh, allow you to more quickly access, you know, these, uh, these assessments that you're looking for. The problem with, especially like with the online self-assessments, is that they're not validated um, they're not necessarily specific to the implementation of that third party solution, application, service, what have you, to your site. And so what you're going to get, and, and again, knowing from, from um, past experience coming from several multinational uh, organizations, that if you are to you know, um, uh, rely on a self-assessment, a company level self-assessment, you're, you're really not getting what you're looking for from a third party risk management perspective. You're getting a piece of paper uh, just modestly better than putting in your contract that they have to be HIPAA compliant, right? So as we go to the right though, things get a little bit more elegant. You got the technical web scanners of the world, you know, like BitSight and other offerings that start really kind of getting to the root of, of risk, right? Um, it's a part of the problem. It's not the total problem though. So, but they are helping you identify you know, where those technical type of third party solutions and applications may be vulnerable based on kind of publicly available information, vulnerability information. And then as we get more to the right, VRM, GRC, et cetera, those are more sophisticated and complex tools. You know, specifically GRC, governance, risk and compliance tools. They are tools that were purpose built, you know, really to answer the audit uh, question and problem, right? Um, they're the domain of legal and compliance officers, and they do that very well. They help you, you know, organize, collect documentation in response to audits to prove you have policies and procedures in place, et cetera. Um, but they were not designed for the security risk management problem. Yes, some of them have evolved, but again, they're very complex. They take a large team to set up, develop, maintain, and support, but they're not nimble. You know, they don't support you know, kind of the out of band needs that you may have when a coronavirus pops up and you need to tweak your questionnaire for one or two or three uh, um, third parties in order to kind of fast track that approval through the process. And then the promise of all this is, is that last box on the upper right, which is IRM. Let's go to that next slide here, Vikas. So IRM is integrated risk management. And so what we're talking about here is really uh, the next generation of risk management. And, and this is, you know, go ahead and start building this, yes. So what an integrated risk management solution will do 
is, is going to help you encapsulate all risks across your organization, across your enterprise, right? So the first level here is system level, right? So system is everything from a, de a device, a class of devices, applications, or a collection of things, people, processes, software, services, including your, your own resources to assess, you know, for a given function, perhaps, you know, how, the, how uh, what your risk level is. So you can go down to the very tiniest level up to a large system. It could be your registration systems across multiple hospitals that you assess, right? So IRM scales that way. It also then incorporates what we're talking about today, third party risks in their fourth and fifth parties, right? So risk is risk is risk, but the IRM allows you to kind of normalize the processes, the controls you apply to all of these things, system, third party, and then keep going the costs. Then you can also use that to assess internal organizations, be it a whole hospital, a department, an office, right, or collection thereof. And then lastly, all of that rolls up to enterprise level. So what we're talking about here is a site picture that helps you see from a single pane of glass view risks that are normalized. You know, I, I mean that by not just, you know, what they're called, but how they're scored, how they're managed, so that you can look across all of these risks by program, by third party, if you will, to compare one another or across, you know, uh, technologies so you can figure out where to apply your scarce resources. And with that, thank you, Tim. up here and let uh, turn this back over to you, Vikas. Thank you, Tim, appreciate that. Uh, Miroslav, I know that when you saw this, uh, you had a, one particular uh, topic that you really uh, came to mind for you as you thought about the evolving mm -hmm. risk management mm -hmm. platform of the marketplace and, and and so what should companies be considering as they're building uh, feature sets such as these well considering is one thing but in, in terms of capabilities as we talked about scalability wouldn't it be nice to have kind of a data bank or exchange or knowledge base whatever you want to call it of companies and products that have, uh, that have already been vetted and assessed by any of the hospitals throughout the country I know this capability is probably not there yet kind of pie in the sky but that is scalability. In healthcare, many of us use the same need for the same services, same systems, same, same capabilities. We may not all use the same third party vendors, but across a large spectrum of hospitals and providers, I'm pretty sure that someone has reviewed and assessed a vendor or a system that I may just now be starting to look at. Platforms like this can greatly benefit organizations and greatly improve their vendor risk management programs and approach. Having this trusted Rolodex can be invaluable to the process. Thank you, and, and certainly we're in full agreement with you, Miroslav, on that, uh, on that need. And I think we will be seeing those on the market, um, hopefully very shortly. Um, I did wanna mention that we do have a, a detailed architecture and integration uh, slide depicting sort of the interaction of IRM uh, with the greater spectrum of systems that are out there typically found in, in uh, larger organizations. Uh, that will be part of the presentation for those that request it. Uh, so you'll be able to check it out when you get the presentation. So we're going to move on to our next topic here uh, with, uh, with Brian, going back to Brian here, talking about uh, uh, process optimization and some other really important topics uh, as, we, uh, as we move forward. Brian? Thanks, Vikas. Uh, so, you know, as, as Tim and, and we've said several times here today, you know, a good platform um, can really help the process, but without good process, uh, you know, you, you're, you're kind of in trouble uh, when it comes to the platform. It's not going to help you much. Uh, so the third-party risk management process as a whole, it's a whole separate topic that, that requires extensive conversation. In fact, uh, we recently hosted a webinar just on the process and taking you through the entire um, process from soup to nuts. So here I just want to highlight a couple of the key elements of third-party risk management that will allow an organization to manage risk and scale. So we've already talked about process a little bit. Uh, that's a key element of a good program. And I also mentioned governance. Uh, governance means a lot of things to a lot of people, and it's often overlooked in the organization because it seems like a soft objective, you know, some pie in the sky, uh, to steal Miroslav's term, uh, people sitting in a room just talking how things should be uh, without real, any real effectiveness. Um, that's a common sentiment when we first open discussions with a customer, 
though through a fairly simple process, discovery process, the importance of defining the governance rules becomes obvious. You just ask simple questions like, what's the trigger in your organization to ensure a vendor's security program is reviewed? Who in the organization is responsible for overseeing the entire vendor management program? Or how do you ensure that a vendor has a solid security program in place to protect your data? A couple of those types of questions quickly expose the organization's governance deficiencies. Good governance sets the rules of engagement and outlines the process by which the organization engages with vendors. It makes sure that ownership and accountability for the program are clear. Governance sets boundaries for sharing covered information and sets the stage gates in the procurement or contracting process to ensure risks are identified, tracked, and remediated when necessary. And it also outlines a solid third-party review process that specifies the security requirements to be met by any third party. A good technology solution, as Tim described, will facilitate the process that is outlined by the governance rules. Governance rules, process, and technology all need to align for an effective third-party program really to thrive and scale. You can significantly improve the efficiency and scale of your third-party program by understanding a little about the business desire to engage with the vendor and the type of products and services to be provided. Uh, I think Tim already mentioned this a little bit. We call this tiering or categorization. And what that really means is understanding the potential threats that might be posed by a third party can play a large role in how you engage with that vendor. For example, if you know how much data, what kind of data, how they'll be storing and processing the data, and what other parties they may share the data with, can provide important insights even before doing an in-depth assessment of the vendor's solutions and practices. A vendor with little access to sensitive data, facilities, and business practices, for example, might require a much lighter assessment than one with large on-site presence and access to your full complement of the many thousands of PHI records. Your platform should account for these factors and it should set up the assessment accordingly. Uh, I mentioned other parties a moment ago. Your vendor partner may also outsource pieces of their product or service. Uh, cloud computing is a great example. Further exposing your data to additional vendors. We call these additional vendors fourth or even fifth or sixth parties or take it to the end. And being knowledgeable. Sorry. I'm sorry, uh, and, and being knowledgeable about those downstream risks is a key factor in understanding potential enterprise risk. It's also one of the factors to consider when categorizing a vendor prior to undertaking the full-scale assessment. Now, once you understand the parameters of the engagement, you can assign a tier or categorization to the vendor. Setting a tier then allows you to, first of all, ask the right level of questioning during the assessment, and B, it, secondly, it informs the level of risk that you might be willing to accept. Um, I, know, I know Miroslav has a few thoughts on fourth and fifth parties, uh, so I'm going to turn it over to him now to dive a little deeper into that, into that topic. Miroslav? Sure. Thanks, Brian. Um, you made a couple of great points around the entire program and the need for uh, fourth and fifth um, party assessments. As we assess some of our vendors, um, especially the smaller or niche service providers, we send out our uh, standard security risk assessment questionnaires, but we often get responses like, I can't complete this form, I don't know any technical details, or it's secure and it's HIPAA compliant simply because it's in, you know, in the cloud with Amazon or whatever else, um, and they don't have that detail. We can't simply be concerned with and complete our reviews with a third party and stop at that point. We need to drill down further uh, and often, have to educate the vendor why we ask certain questions and why it's important they provide the details we're looking for. We ask them to engage with their provider systems and have those vendors complete technical portions on their behalf. Yes, often the third party will be able to provide a SOC 2 audit report or other certification of the hosting vendor, but, but marking the assessment complete without having direct discussions with and documentation from those fourth and sometimes fifth party vendors is not appropriate nor, nor, nor sufficient. Often smaller third party vendors don't connect all of the security and privacy dots either. They don't think about education of their staff on how to securely 
and appropriately handle valid information and how to follow security best practices around access of systems and data. One typical gap we find is lack of process around access, multi-factor authentication, unique passwords, how regularly uh, they verify and validate their user logins from password changes to removing terminated employees and notifying us to do the same on our side. How is the access by their employer audited or managed? What is their process around any paper-based information and documents and so on? All these play into overall risk profile of the vendors and how to properly assess them and the risk they may expose to our organization directly. Thank you, Miroslav. Um, so for our final section, before we wrap up uh, with uh, Miroslav's final thoughts, uh, I'll turn it back over to Brian Parks to talk about uh, keys to adoption. Thanks, Vikas. And we won't spend much time here. Uh, we've covered a lot of these topics today, but I want to drive home a couple of points. You know, we've talked process, we've talked technology, we've talked uh, program governance. And, and now that you know, we kind of have that basis, um, you, you actually need to take steps to adopt them. Adoption is equivalent to change. People and even organizations have different tolerances for embracing that change. Measuring adoption for any new concept can be re represented in a typical bell curve, stretching from the innovators on the left here uh, who are eager to jump in on any new concept or technology all, with, all the way to the right side where you have the laggards who are very slow to get on board and they want the concept fully matured before adopting. Across healthcare, third-party risk management, though not a new concept, is still just gaining momentum. momentum. I'd put it as a whole in the early majority phase at best across this continuum. CISOs most definitely recognize the importance. They're trying to address the need, but in some cases they're struggling to get a strong program and effective platform in place with the full unwavering support of the organization. Adoption across, next slide please. Adoption across the organization, first of all, requires buy-in from all the stakeholders. Finance, risk and compliance, legal, procurement, IT, business operations, they all have to proactively manage the risk posed by third parties. Any of these groups might be in a position to identify and have the responsibility to determine that a third party product or service requires a review. Proper governance rules will help outline the entire program for the enterprise. Once you get that buy-in though, potential hurdle is selling the concept of a tool or platform to assist with administering, administering the program and to manage the enterprise risk. This could be viewed as just another piece of software at additional cost and unnecessary to actually run the program. But as Tim discussed earlier, and that this is where that great Bill K Bill Gates quote comes to mind, automation applied to an efficient operation will magnify the efficiency. And we talked about not adding staff to try to scale up. Uh, this is where it's really critical. A platform can make all the difference and it's critical to the success of your program. Additional barriers to adoption might include a lack of understanding of how third parties can pose risk to the entire organization. And that a business associate agreement, which used to be um, very prevalent thinking that a business associate agreement does not alone protect the organization. It's a regulation that you have to have one, but it doesn't protect you. Finally, there's a perception that the participating in the third party program will get in the way and slow down the implementation of critical products and services. While third party risk management does put stage gates and measures in place, it can be done without being disruptive. One can easily demonstrate the benefits of a TPRM program and an effective platform. They can pay for themselves many times over if they prevent even one breach. So you can consider it your insurance policy. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Miroslav, I know you have some thoughts here and, and deal with this topic uh, you know, within your organization around adoption. Mm -hmm. uh, can you share some of that with us? Sure. Um, just, I want to start out by saying that at Valley, I'm very fortunate to have a great deal of support and direct engagement from senior leadership and from the executive team who continue to communicate the big picture across the organization, uh, whether it be through formal education or through frequent and daily interaction and activities with staff at, at all different levels. 
uh, as an example, pro programs like Highly Re Reliable Organization or HRO um, is one of those being reinforced consistently across the Valley. Um, Live Valley's leadership provides this high level vision of where we need to be um, as an organization to, in, in order to be a successful provider. It builds on reinforcements on concepts all healthcare professionals can relate to. And some of these actually fit into the, the model of, again, engaging people in, in the risk process. So uh, some examples, do no harm, which includes developing and um, following repeatable processes, deference to expertise, continuous process improvement, safe culture, which includes risk management and risk avoidance, uh, plan, do, add, act, check, and, and other components of um, HRO. Once these concepts are ingrained in every employee and every staff member across the board, all the benefits are understood and actions or behaviors are aligned with this culture. CISOs have a fertile ground to develop a more specific skills, skills and understanding in order for them to participate in the program. Programs like data governance, compliance, risk management, due diligence, they all feed on that kind of culture behavior and improve the process. Working with internal and external experts, automating manual tasks, reminders, building up the knowledge base and data collection of information required, and making it easily accessible and usable across the organizations should enable organization to maintain the rigor and focus on the enterprise risk management and other governance programs. Miroslav, thank you for those uh, closing comments. And uh, I know that we all wanna say that uh, stay hungry, stay focused, continuously evolve, uh, work within your organizations to adopt some of these programs, practices, uh, and platforms, and uh, we will do this, and we will do this together. So with that, uh, we thank everyone very much. We will go to the Q&A section uh, now. I know that we have uh, a question or two. Uh, so for um, the panel, we will be asking uh, yeah. one question, maybe two questions here. But Siobhan, if you have any housekeeping to do at the end before we get to that, please, uh, please go ahead. Um, nope, I think we're good. If anybody has any uh, questions after this, want to email us, you can email me at scarroll, S-C-A-R-R-O-L-L, -L, at enterprisehealth.com or the email address on the screen. Um, we do have a white paper if anybody's interested. And um, Vikas, I think you have some questions. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Miroslav, you mentioned uh, earlier in your in your talk uh, cleaning up once you were able to refocus and you know when you were going through the, the pandemic and the response to the pandemic being able to refocus on vendors whose solutions were implemented uh, during that response. Um, are, are, are you there yet? Are you doing that cleanup? If so, can you talk a little bit about the approach uh, you're either taking or planning to take as things open back up uh, and the priority you, you'll give those assessments versus the current queue or, or others? Sure, obviously we're still in the midst of um, this whole process. Uh, systems are still being actively used uh, and we're managing. We do, however, um, the discipline that we have um, in IS certainly is that no matter how small um, the new system was that needed to be implemented, they did check with, our, with us internally security to see how comfortable we are with certain things. And we have to, again, for the benefit of patients and patient care and expediting some of these things, we gave a green light to some of the things under condition that when this is all done, it is documented that we will go back and reassess. And, and some of these reassessments will have to take into consideration things like success of the system. Is it a enterprise type level system or do we, or do we resort to kind of off the shelf consumer based product to make it easy for the patients and the families to communicate? Uh, we have to weigh the benefits uh, of the of the application or service, and see um, if there is any, what, what what risks are brought forward with that, and weigh that, and working with business units to go back and say, you know what, maybe it's not appropriate long term to have this, and look at the tools that we either have been looking at long term or have in our bag of tricks, for lack of a better word, that may provide similar functionality, maybe not exactly the same, but similar and see again the way that the um, pros and cons of either expanding and doing a full risk assessment for the new product and, and look to replace what we have or uh, kind of work with our end users and slowly transition at the right time, transition um, to a product that we want to use long-term. 
but there certainly are. There's, you know, documentation. Everything is um, laid out that we need to go back to. And prioritizing what we have now versus that, again, it's all going to be depending on timing and the urgency um, of, of using this service or system. Yeah, certainly a lot to be figured out in, in this uh, sort of a new world, a new mode of, uh, of business and operations. So I, I, I want to, I know folks have probably meetings to go to, so I want to give folks time to transition to that. I, I want to thank our, all of our speakers today, especially Miroslav Lod, uh, our keynote speaker, Brian, Tim, thank you so much for, for your contributions. We uh, hope you got value out of this presentation. Uh, we, we will be doing more. Uh, upcoming. And so please keep checking our website and our LinkedIn. And uh, we hope to be speaking to you very shortly down the road. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day.